So data mining is key to successful betting or trading. After all, if you don't have data and you haven't looked at the data, how are you going to know what is a good price, what to do and when, when to get into a market, when to get out, all of those sort of things. You need all of that data to be able to do that. Well, that's the common narrative. That's what people would like you to think. But in fact, the reality is somewhat different. So in this video, I'm going to tell you why data mining doesn't work and exactly what you should be doing. I've been successfully betting and trading for over two decades. If you want more videos like this and you want me to describe more of what I do, then give us a like. If you want to talk to like-minded people, visit the Bet Angel Forum where you can do exactly that, but also visit our website where you can download a free trial of Bet Angel. So I do gather data and I do collect data. I have a veritable treasure trove of data. I have millions of different sports markets and I use that data in a very particular way. Uh, but I also use it in a way that um, you don't generally see data being positioned. But more importantly, one of the things that I do all of the time is every time I trade a market, I archive that data. I've done it since the day I first started trading. And that is because I can reflect on it and look at it um, figure out where I'm going wrong, improve the bits that I'm doing well. And, you know, such is the glamour of the life that I lead that basically every Monday when it's quiet, I sit down, I look at the data from last week, I file it, even if I don't look at it. Um, and then I basically will analyze and see if I could have done things better or if there's anything interesting or if I want to kickstart a new project using that data. But yeah, gathering data is and should be an essential part of what you do even if it's just on your performance, because that will allow you to look at it and improve it going forward. So yeah, I do recommend that you actually gather data, but it's important to differentiate gathering data and actually using it, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So I am pretty skeptical on historical data. Um, you do need it and it's interesting to have, but the way that it's positioned a lot of the time is completely false. You see services like Opta saying, oh, so-and-so haven't scored for six games in a row where so-and-so hasn't been playing. And it's like, so? <laughs> you know, what relevance is that? And um, you very often see these sort of things happening. And, you know, people sort of say, oh, when, when a team is 1-0 up after 30 minutes, this is the case. Um, or, you know, uh, a horse has traded 50% below its starting price in three out of the last five races. All that you're looking at there is a description of that data. It's not giving you any predictive capacity at all it's just reflecting what is within that database and that's why it's dangerous because you would see something like a horse that runs at Windsor on a Monday who has the letter J in its name with saddlecloth 3 wins more often than you would typically expect according to the data but that bears no relevance on the future if you roll that strategy out it'll suddenly start losing money and everything begins to revert to mean so you have to be careful how you use data collect it but when you look at that data you need to do something fundamentally different from it but the reason that I'm skeptical on, on data is because a lot of databases come up with total nonsense. They're there to justify a bit of bet stimulus for the industry um, or to get you to buy the data on the basis that it may contain information. But all it is is a reflection on that particular data that has been collected. That fact aside, lots of data is available free of charge now. You can even go into the forum and download masses of football data if you want to have a play around and analyze data and look for something. Um, and, you know, what tends to happen is people repackage publicly available data and charge you money for it. It doesn't really contain much, and it certainly doesn't contain what you need to be able to use that data effectively. So I'll give you a clear example here. I've seen um, data based around Betfair SP um, and the high and low price that something has reached in play. That data is available completely free from the Betfair website. They have a database can't remember how far it goes back it's quite large I pull data from it interestingly enough and I know lots of people in the forum do and in fact you can get um, a downloader available on the forum where you can pull in and analyze that data as well but basically what that's doing is it's showing you everything that's happened within horse racing and greyhound markets across different territories if I remember correctly um, but there's a fundamental flaw with the SP data um, so all of the systems and strategies that you have seen built around SP or are back-tested against SP are all wrong. And that's quite a bold statement to make, but I know that that's the case because I've looked at it, I've analysed it, I can see where the floor is and I can describe exactly what the floor is as well. And that is you have the pre-off period in horse racing, then you have the in-play period. And when we switch from that pre-off to the in-play period on Betfair, 
that's when the SP is resolved. Somebody presses a button, the SP reconciliation process fires up and then an SP is delivered. Now the problem is, is that switching of the market to the in-play period is five to six seconds behind exactly what's going on on course. Always knew this was the case, but when I've been using total performance data, you can see the gap so clearly because I can tell when the race actually is off, when the stalls fly open and when Betfair turn the race in play. And there's a huge gap. So what you're seeing there is not the starting price of the horse, the last traded price or the most accurate price within the market. You're seeing a price there that is five to six seconds in the race. So it includes horses that have broken well or not broken well. It contains all of that information. It is not the true price that was traded before the race went in play. It's partially in play. And that is why it is fundamentally flawed. So this is where the V1 bomb enters the video. Not literally, I hope. Anyhow, what happened during World War II was um, all of these bombs started arriving. You know, it was the first time anybody had ever seen a flying bomb. And they were interested in the technology, uh, the British military. Um, and one of the things they were interested in is, is it being specifically targeted? Um, or are they just chucking them over? So what they actually went off and did was they plotted all of the bomb sites that they could find. Um, and then they basically tried to figure out how these bomb sites were distributed. Because if they were very specifically targeted, you would see a, a very steep peak within that data. But if they were randomly targeted, it would basically conform to a normal distribution. And that was exactly what they found. So they sort of did this backwards. They looked at the data, they, they fitted it into a normal distribution, and then they could figure out the chance, basically, of a bomb landing anywhere in particular, uh, because they'd gathered the data, the average number of times that a bomb would hit in certain areas, and so on and so forth. Um, but basically, when you use a distribution, um, you generate that distribution from a set of data. That's why I collect data. I want to gather as much data as I can so I can see how it's distributed. And once you get that curve, then you can basically take a mean and you can actually uh, then predict what's going to happen in the future. And there are many different curves that you can apply to data. So part of the process is gathering the data, interpreting, clean, cleaning, making sure the data is correct, then plotting that data and then understanding what that curve looks, looks like. Because if you get the curve accurate or reasonably accurate, you can look at a market, or you can look at any set of data and you can project forward exactly uh, what that means in the future. You can basically anticipate, given a certain amount of data and a certain type of thing that's likely to happen within the market, exactly what could be about to happen based upon that data set. And that is exactly how you should be using data. So looking here at a spreadsheet, um, don't freak out. I'm going to try and keep things as simple as possible. There is so much to explore here that in fact there's a whole different world to look at here. I just wanted to demonstrate how you would use data and how you can use data to predict what's going to happen in the future. So what you can see over here is we have got 10 events and these are the outcome of each of these events. Now it's important when you're looking at data to understand how these are related because you know does the fact that something um, had a two here influence the outcome of the next event? Because you have to, when you're trying to create a model, you have to decide whether events are related or independent. So on this example, I'm assuming that there is no level of uh, relationship between each of these particular outcomes. Um, so basically, we're looking at 10 events. This is what happened in each one of these individual events. And then we end up with an average, the number of outcomes that occurs during these particular events that we're looking at. And you can see here that there's a, a run of like five in a row here. So what's going to happen on event number 11? Does this mean that it's definitely going to be a one or it can't be a one because we've had five in a row? Or is it more likely or less likely? Well, the idea behind creating a model is that you actually get an answer to that. You pump more and more data into the model and then you get a more and more accurate representation of what's going to happen on that event 11. And you can see here that we've done an average. So I've basically just used this Excel function to average out all of the outcomes here. But I've also added in a standard deviation. So you can see here, I've also done a standard deviation on the outcome of each one of these events. And that's how we've come up with those two numbers. I've then put that into another formula, which is the normal distribution. So you can see here by pumping in the data, which is the average and the standard deviation, 
and the outcome that we're expecting, which is zero, we're basically saying, um, if we have all of this data here, what's the chance of it being a zero on number 11? And it's come back and said it's about a 14% chance based upon the data that you've collected. And then basically we've gone down and you can see here, we've got the same function, but it's just asking the question, what happens? Uh, you know, what's the chance of one occurring given all of the data that we have over here? So you can see that says the chance of a one is much higher. So you can begin to see the relationship here between the amount of data that you collect, the quality of the data, and then how that translates. Because we're saying the chance of zero being the next sequence in this particular uh, next event in this sequence is about 14%. The chance of it being one is 45%. And you can see all of the differences um, and how that plays out to there. And you can also see that we've basically multiplied the number of events, which is 10 by um, what it thinks the occurrence will be. And you can see how that sort of goes into the mix there as well. So it's important to do this so that you can get feedback on the quality of the data that you're using and whether this curve, this model fits the data that you're looking at. Because you can see I've also used another uh, function here called uh, the probability, uh, sorry, the uh, Poisson distribution. It's, a, it's another probability density function. It's a different version. You can get Erlang distributions, Poisson, normal. There are loads of different types. Um, um, but you can see that these numbers don't sort of particularly fit very nicely. And if we do a, a, a graph, that would look very different as well. But basically what we've done here is we've taken a sequence of events. You would definitely use more than 10. We've assigned each of them an outcome. And then to work out what the next one will be, we've basically plugged these numbers in to a distribution of one sort or another. Um, and then that tells us what the chance of what the next occurrence will be. And that's essentially why you'd use data and why you would model data, because it gives you the opportunity to look at data and then project forward. So in summary, um, when you know data's data's great. I love data. I love it more the merrier. I've got data um, going from you know really generally broad sort of concepts and like scores down to absolutely minute detail into in each individual sport. I've analysed everything in such incredible depth, but most of that is really just a refinement for me that's occurred over many many years. Um, you don't actually need to have that level of data to be able to do something sensible. And certainly, if you're using data to look back at something, um, that's all that you're doing. That's the message I'm trying to get across here. Data mining is statistical deja vu. If you look at something and then try and use that to project forward in the future, it very often doesn't fit. And if you build a system based upon something that you've seen and then start running that system, it will eventually fail because it will revert to mean. I will happily sit on the other side of that for the rest of my life. Uh, because I know what does and doesn't work and that does not work. What you're trying to do is to create some sort of a model so that you can identify something that is likely to happen in the future. And the more data you've got, the better that model will become. But you're also going to have to sort of fit it into, you know, there are many ways that you can fit that data. You don't have to use standard methods. You don't have to use a standard distribution. You could use many different things to look at it. But fundamentally speaking, that's what you're trying to do. The data will reinforce something that will allow you to project forward what's likely to happen in the future. And if you know what's likely to happen in the future, you can anticipate it. And if you can anticipate it, you will make money. <laughs>